All right. Y'all ready for the word? All right, good, because you're going to get it today. <laughs> um, I, this is one of those, you probably should take notes kind of Sunday. Um, so if you have a pen and paper, go ahead and take notes. Take out your, your notes on your phone, whatever works for y'all. Um, I, I want to give you an illustration first. I want to give you a picture to put in your mind for today. Um, I want you to imagine a child, whether you were a child or whether you have a child who, let's say that this child or you, um, let's say that you were supposed to stay where you were. You were supposed to do, get a few things done. You know, your, your dad may have given you some instructions and you decided, you know, I don't want to do it. I'm going to slip out of the house. And you slip out of the house, and the curiosity grows, and this child ends up climbing a tree. And the further this child climbs a tree, they get lost in their little world until they realize they can't get down from the tree. And all of a sudden, this child's terrified, and they're scared, they're lost, they feel lost, And this child only wants to be rescued. Well, the parents are frantically searching for this child. And all of a sudden, they hear the cries up in the tree. And people have run to this child's rescue. And as this child is looking down and seeing everybody run towards them, they only are looking for one person. And that one person that they're looking for is their father. Because this father is their safe place. They know that this father's arms are the safest arms that they can run into when they have to make that leap from the tree to the ground. And their father is going to be the one to catch them. Well, the father comes and he looks up and he calls out to his son and he says, just jump, I'll catch you. And the, the child jumps and runs into the father's arms or, or falls into the father's arms and, and he's safe. And afterwards, the father takes this child and he comforts him and he maybe even takes him out to go get his favorite treat. Okay, I'm here. Everything's going to be okay. And then in the process, child kind of coming down from this emergency and this fear and knowing that they're safe, then the father is able to have this conversation with their child. Why did you climb this tree? Why did you not stay where I told you to stay? Well, I gave you this illustration so that you can have in your mind the maturation process that we as Christians go through. When we get saved, we go through this time in our journey of encountering and and understanding who God is, right? We start going to church to learn about God. We read our Bible because we want to understand this God that we have just learned about. For some of us who've been raised in church, um, Some of us have gone through uh, experiences in which we're realizing, wait, I don't think that I was necessarily taught what I should have been taught. Maybe I learned about God the wrong way. I got the wrong perspective, and you're having to unlearn some of the religion that you may have encountered somewhere else. There's that process as well. And then you hit this moment in your maturation process where you start uh, practicing and exercising your faith, right? You, you take steps. You, you learn to start trusting God and learning to, you know, to take these steps of obedience. You're learning to pray for people. You're learning to trust God. You're learning to, um, you know, just grow as a Christian, Oftentimes, in that place right there is where we may pause. We stop. And sometimes we grow either stagnant or we, um, we, we think that that is the only place we're supposed to go. Like, that's, that's it. 
And then we stay, you, we can look back 20 years later and realize, wait, I haven't grown. Or, and this is something that my husband and I actually have a name for. I don't even know if it's an actual phrase for it, but we have a name for it because it's inevitable. It will happen to everybody. It happened to us. It, it's a guarantee. It's something that we call the test of ministry, right, Ted? We call it the test of ministry. And in this test of ministry, oftentimes what happens is we may start stepping out. We may step into some kind of ministry uh, where we're doing something that's, you know, outside of our comfort level. And we're starting to learn to express ourselves, usually in a church setting or at home. But then something happens in life where the trials come we get confused or uh, there's an offense with somebody or we start comparing ourselves to somebody. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay, we all have that, do we not? Has everybody encountered that or experienced that? Good, because we have too. What happens in that moment when you are faced with those trials of life, with those offenses, with whatever comes at you, and how we respond to that will determine whether or not you're going to be prepared for the next phase of ministry, next phase of life, how you're going to be able to handle it. Because if you don't know how to handle it and don't learn how to trust God, grow, surrender, a lot of the, the, the worship today was a lot about surrender, which is interesting how that happens. It's a lot about surrender. A lot of times we think in our heads, and religion has taught us that it's about less is me and more of God, but that's, that's not God's perspective. God says, I want all of you. I want all of you. I want to go into the recesses of your heart and show you how trustworthy I am. It's in the surrender that we start learning how to trust our Father. It's in the surrender that we start learning what we have been given and all that we have been given in Christ. So when we don't know how to surrender and allow the Lord to go into those recesses, and usually it's based on fear, it's based on something that we're not willing to surrender to, and then what what happens, and this is a phrase my husband came up with, we go around the mountain over and over and over. We just keep experiencing the same thing, same trials, where every time somebody hurts us, we respond the same way, the hurt gets it's harder. It's harder, 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 harder. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Everybody's nodding their head. Good. All right. That right there is a, is a term. We'll write a book about it because it sounds like nobody else has come up with it. You'll go around the mountain, right? And it's the test of ministry. The goal, the goal is to learn to surrender in order to be prepared for the next phase of ministry. So today is about, um, I'm going to kind of take you through a couple of phases here, very much like what I did, but in a greater level. And um, it's about, it's it's a maturation. It's about maturation. It's about what we're called to, okay? It's about the responsibility of being a Christian, okay? That's where we're going. All right, so, and the, the, the biggest reason I'm speaking this message today is also because um, coming up in August, August 8th, it's a Thursday night, a Friday night, and an all-day Saturday, I will be teaching a course on this, all right? This is like an introduction, and I want to um, give you a taste for it, but also I want to encourage everybody to be a part of that because that's a really important facet, and you'll find out what I'm going to talk about here in a minute. Um, it's a, it's good. It's an important facet of life share church. It's, it's part of our DNA and it's an equipping message that's going to help you. And it's also going to help us grow as a church. All right. The first thing that we are going to cover, and this is where your pen needs to come out because I don't have notes for you, but I have the slides. What I, I don't, you can write down the reference. That's all you'll have time for. And I want you to write down, and I'll, well, let me just get started and I'll tell you what to write down. Okay, first of all, I want to talk about the reason Jesus came. 
the reason Jesus came, and I'm just going to um, run a bunch of scripture here. It just, I mean, like, hang on. The first scripture verse that I want to throw out <laughs> is 1 John 3, 8. Why Jesus came, 1 John 3, 8. For this purpose... The Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Okay, you're going to write down works of the devil in the reference so that you have the notes. Uh, so, number one, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Mark 138. But he said to them, let us go into the next towns. He's talking to his disciples. That I may preach there also because for this purpose I have come forth. So he came to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus only ever preached the gospel of the kingdom. Keep in mind, it says he came forth. He came forth from where? Where did he come from? John 8, 42. I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Jesus came from the Father. He came from the Father, and he came with a purpose. John 16, 28, I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. Again, it tells us right there, he came forth from the Father into the world with a purpose, and he would not return back to the Father until he's accomplished his purpose. Luke 19, 9 through 10. Today, salvation has come to this house. He's talking about Zacchaeus. This is a story of Zacchaeus. Today, salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and save that which was lost. I want you to keep in mind here what Jesus just called Zacchaeus. He just called him a son of Abraham. That is so important. Anytime you see Jesus referencing somebody as the son of Abraham, he is making a loud, loud, loud point that we have forgotten throughout history because we do not understand the Jewish culture and what Jesus was talking about. The reason why Jesus called Zacchaeus a son of Abraham and then said, I have come to seek and save that which was lost. What Jesus was referring to and that 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 was lost was sonship. Sonship. There was a covenant that God made with Abraham. And that covenant was a covenant that God made while Abraham was asleep. Abraham had no part in agreement in that covenant. Abraham was asleep. God made that covenant with each other and included Abraham in that covenant. Part of that covenant, and actually the entirety of that covenant, was it, first of all, it was an everlasting covenant. It was a covenant that had no end, and it's still continuing today. And God told Abraham, through your seed in your generations, all the nations of the earth would be blessed all of the generations, I have given you a covenant that that brought you in as a king and a priest, and I want all of the nations to be blessed through you. Part of that covenant included, it. it what it is, is it, it, it didn't make it about Abraham. It made it about God's promise. God is a covenant keeper. God is the one who would keep his promise. He would never fail in that promise to Abraham. No matter what Abraham did, no matter what, how much he failed, God would never fail in his promise to Abraham. So he didn't call Zacchaeus a son of Moses. He called Zacchaeus a son of Abraham. He was pointing back to the sonship that God had made with Abraham. That's what he was pointing to whenever Jesus said that they are a daughter of Abraham or a son of Abraham. What he's referring to is God's intent for mankind to be blessed and all the earth to be blessed through them. And we are included in that. You are included as a child of Abraham. All right. He says that about Zacchaeus. And I made a point because that's going to come up again here in a minute. 
He came to seek and save that which was lost, sonship. Matthew eleven twenty seven. all things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. There's another reason why Jesus came. He came to reveal the Father. Up until that point, nobody knew God as Father, They knew him as judge. And Jesus said, I am the one who knows the Father, and I have come to reveal the Father. John 12, 47. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge them. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Jesus came to save the world. I think we have, and I've said this before, we have the wrong idea of judgment. And you know how we can write that understanding of judgment? We go to the book of Judges to find out how God judged. The way that God judged is he always judged a people group who were coming against his people. What God judges is the thing that is opposed to his kids. What is opposed to us, what is against us, what is destroying us, that's what God judges. Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy it, but to fulfill it. Jesus fulfilled the law. Jesus fulfilled the prophets. Jesus became the fulfillment. And all of the judgment of the law was put on Jesus. And from the point of his death, that is the point a new covenant, a new and a better covenant was enacted where no longer would we we be under any blessings or cursings. It would only be blessing. All of the blessings of God and in and uh, 10 times, 100, 1,000 times more blessing, everything that Jesus is, we have inherited through Christ. He nailed the requirement of the law on the cross, and he became the fulfillment of the prophet. All right, John 1, 11 through 14, he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Who is the word? Jesus. Jesus came forth from the Father. He is the voice of God. He is the one that God has spoken. He came out of the Father's mouth, and he came and and he accomplished everything that God set out for him to do, and he did not return back to the Father until that purpose was fulfilled. Psalm 107, 19 through 20. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of all of their distresses. He sent his word, and he healed them, and he delivered them from their destruction. When, if we can understand why it is that we needed saving and what Jesus did on the cross, our minds would be blown Our minds would be blown because no longer are we working in order to get forgiveness. We realize that we have been forgiven. We have been set free. We have been rescued. Jesus came to unlock the chain that held us captive. Sin held us captive. Oppression held us captive. Satan held us captive. We were born like dead men walking. We had no way of escape. Jesus came to unlock the chains and to set us free. That's what Jesus did. Jesus saved us. He saved us from the tyrant that kept us bound. Jesus is the word. 
Isaiah 55, 9 through 11. Pay attention to this first part because God is giving us an analogy to help us understand something. He says, for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth in bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Let's pause right there. God is telling us, he's, he's showing us, he's giving us a mental picture of, of something that breathes life. He says rain falls and snow comes. When it melts and when the rain falls, it waters the soil and it, and it feeds the fruit. And, it, and the fruit produces seed and the seed is, is made food for us. And it's a cycle that is always life-giving. And when it returns, it always returns with life, right? Isn't that what God is saying? In light of that, God says, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Do you get the picture? Jesus is the word. Jesus is the word, and he came forth out of the mouth of the Father. He accomplished everything that he set out to do. Everything that he set out to do. Jesus said that he only ever did what he saw and heard his father doing. Everything that Jesus did, he did because he saw his father doing. We have got to get the idea that it is bad God, good Jesus. That's religion. And religion has done a great job of creating unbelief in Christians' minds. Because what religion has taught us is that God is an angry God who is opposed to sinful people, humanity. And yet that's not what Paul preached. Paul did not preach that. And the early church fathers did not preach that. That's not what Jesus said. God is not an angry God. God is a good God and he's a good father. And Jesus came to restore us back into sonship. It's our lens that was changed. God came to restore our vision and our minds about who God is. God is a, is a perfect heavenly father whose goodness is chasing after us. Jesus only wanted to do what pleased his father. That means every time you read the gospels and you see what Jesus did, what he did was a perfect representation of the heavenly father. What did Jesus do? John 5, 30. He said, I can of myself do nothing. Jesus couldn't do anything unless the Father showed him and empowered him. Same with us. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous. Remember what I said about judgment? My judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. There, there's the proof. Jesus came to fulfill God's plan. Luke 4.18. Luke 4.18 um, is when Jesus stood up for the first time in the synagogue and he pulled out the scroll of Isaiah and he quoted Isaiah 61. He quoted this right before he began his ministry. And he said this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. When we have the right picture of salvation, we will understand what the scripture verse is saying. He came to set the captives free. He came to change our minds about God. Take off the blinders of religion. To take off the blinders that keep us from receiving and knowing the love of a good heavenly father. He came to heal us. He came to rescue us. He came to deliver us. That's what Jesus came to do. When did he do it? When did he do it? Jesus, Isaiah 53 gives us a picture, and I'm not going to read it to you, but Isaiah 53 was a prophetic a declaration 
of what Jesus would do when he died on the cross. And he says one thing about, actually, let, let's read it on my notes. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Isaiah is talking about what Jesus would do. Did you know that all of Matthew chapter 8 is a commentary of the fulfillment of Isaiah? Every miracle that Jesus performed in Matthew 8 is actually a commentary of the fulfillment of this prophecy right here. Peter, after the cross, in 1 Peter 2, 24, he said this, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And by his wounds, you have been healed. Past tense. He accomplished healing at the cross. It was done. He did it. It is finished. It is finished. Jesus, the word of God accomplished. If he didn't accomplish everything that God set out for him to do, he would still be on this earth. But he accomplished everything that God set out for him to do. And he returned back to the father. And he said at his death, John records it. He said, what? It is finished. Whenever you hear me say the finished work of the cross, that's what I'm talking about. It includes everything that God set out for Jesus to do. We are the recipients of the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus finished. Turn in your Bible to Luke 13. And we're going to be in uh, verse 10. In this story... Jesus was in the synagogue, and I'll just, I'll just start reading in verse 10. 13, 10, Luke 13, 10. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and there was a woman who for 18 years had, been, had had a sickness caused by a spirit, and she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, woman, You are freed from your sickness. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. But the synagogue official, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the crowd in response, there are six days in which work should be done, so come during them and get healed, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? And this woman, a daughter of Abraham, as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from the bond on the Sabbath day? And he said this, all of his opponents were being humiliated, and the entire crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things being done by him. I'm sure many of you have read this story a lot of times. Think about it. A woman who only had dust to look at, people's feet to look at for 18 years, bent over. When's the first time you hear about dust in the Bible? If you're familiar with your Bible, maybe you may remember that dust is mentioned in Genesis. When God was telling the serpent and the the woman and the man what they let in and what would happen to them now that they let in what they weren't supposed to let in, the thing that he told the serpent is that the serpent would eat dust. Dust represents our flesh. It always represents our flesh. And it is always representative of condemnation. This woman had been going to the Sabbath and hearing the law read to her for 18 years. And the only thing that it produced was condemnation. 
The only thing that it produced was more sickness and it could not bring freedom and it could not bring life. That's what the law did. When we listen to condemnation and we listen to the law and we believe that we are unworthy sinners who are unable to receive the righteousness of God, when we believe that God is against us and he is not for us, when we say things like, oh, not me, God, less of me, less of me, God, that all right there is a representative that we don't understand the goodness and the fullness of what God has given us. He doesn't want less of you. He wants more of you. He wants all of you. And he wants you to receive everything that he has given you. So saying things like, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You may not feel like you are, but you say that you are because you come into agreement with what God has said about you. Whenever condemnation wants to lie to you and say, I'm unworthy, I'm offended. This person did this to me. I don't understand why this person got promoted and I didn't get promoted. Why, God, did you allow this to happen to me? Why, God, if you knew that I was going to get hurt, why did you allow me to go down this path? God, why did you allow me to X, Y, and Z, fill in the blanks? Whenever we say things like that, what we are saying is we don't understand what it is that Christ has done for us. He has set us free from condemnation, and he has given us all of himself. So when we come into agreement with what God has said about us, we can hold our heads up, and we can say, no, I am the righteous of God in Christ Jesus and no evil thing shall come against me because if God is for me who can be against me that's the position we live from that's where Jesus brought us into when sickness comes against our bodies we can look at sickness and we can say you are from Satan that's what Jesus said about this didn't he he didn't say oh I put this sickness on her to teach her a lesson I know you can handle this it's an honor for you to be sick. No, that is not what Jesus did. No, don't believe it. When you hear that, when you see that, when that's glorified, reject it. Because the only thing that that's going to do is it's going to take you down a path of condemnation. And it's a vortex that is almost impossible to get yourself out of unless you have somebody like, what are you thinking? Get out of that. I'm here to tell you that today. If Jesus said that this spirit of infirmity was from Satan, I would take Jesus' word for it. I would stop saying things like, oh, God loves me so much that he put this sickness on me. Oh, if that's the case, then it's wrong for you to go to the doctor. Because if you believe that that's God who is allowing you to go through this, then you should probably allow God to finish all of that work. And trust me, it's not fun. God's for us. He's for our healing. He's so for our healing. He bore the stripes on his back. So put the blame where the blame belongs. The blame belongs on Satan. Call it what it is. It'll free you. It'll allow you to receive what it is that Jesus accomplished on the cross. She was a daughter of Abraham. Did you catch that? He called her a daughter of Abraham. He came to restore her dignity. What was lost? She wasn't a daughter of the Mosaic law. The law condemned. The law is the one that said, you know what the law would have taught? She's sick. Therefore, she must have had some kind of sin in her life. That's what the law taught. If she was sick, the law would have said, her parent must have sinned. And so she's reaping the consequences of that sin. That's what the law says. That's not what Jesus said. And he never said that. Actually, you'll never ever find that in the Bible. God, Jesus never blamed anybody for any kind of sickness except Satan. What Jesus did there is he was fulfilling his ministry. And he didn't wait until Sabbath was over. Jesus did it then. He did it right there and then. So here is the progression. Here's the Father. Jesus and the Holy Spirit are in full agreement. They're all together making an agreement. There's a scripture verse in Romans that says that God was in Christ 
God, the fullness of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. There was full agreement. Jesus comes forth from the Father. He comes into the world. He gathers us into his heart, takes us back into the bosom of the Father in his arms. We are hidden in him. All that he is is now ours. And then Jesus comes back after his resurrection. And he gives us a responsibility. John 20, 21. He's talking to his disciples and he says, peace be with you. He's the peace. He's with them. Jesus was peace. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. You hear that responsibility? In the same way that Jesus left the bosom of the Father, he now has given us a responsibility here in this world. Mark 16, 15. Please don't get scared. I know this is the scripture verse that a lot of Pentecostals will read. They're comfortable reading it. Most other pastors are, but this is the responsibility that Jesus did give us. So we need to look at the scripture verse. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. God does not condemn them. The law condemns them, and our conscience condemns us. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. And they will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. And I believe this is the journey of a Christian's walk right here to look at every single one of those and say, do I believe the will? It's a shall. It's a guarantee. So the question is, do we believe it? Do we believe it? Have you all ever, I know some of the ladies have heard of this person because I had them read a book called Unveiling Jesus and the stories in it, but there's a lot of you probably haven't read it. Has anybody anybody ever heard of a Japanese um, soldier by the name of Hiro Unoda? Unoda, I think that's how you say it. Anybody? All right, let me tell you this story. So... During World War II, this is a Japanese soldier that was sent to the Philippines. And he was sent to the Philippines to perform guerrilla warfare and to um, protect this place that, they, that the Japanese had set up. And they were su- to surrender at no cost. In fact, one of the things that their, the commander has set, had told him, um, even if you have to eat coconuts, you're going to live off of coconuts. You- and you cannot take your own life. You can up voluntarily. You will stay here and you will, you will stay put and you will perform guerrilla warfare. You will do these tasks, okay? He said, do not surrender unless I personally, his colonel said, I personally come to tell you that the war is over. Well, the war ended and everybody forgot about Officer Haru. So Officer Haru is in the Philippines with two other people, and for years, years, they stayed in the jungles of the Philippines performing guerrilla warfare. Finally, the Philippines started getting so fed up at getting getting shot at that they hired a, a pilot to fly overhead and to drop some pamphlets that said the war is over. Well, when they got these pamphlets, they thought it was propaganda from the enemy. So he told his soldiers, no, don't believe it. Don't believe it. Well, 30 years later, he's still in the jungles of the Philippines. True story. Y'all can look it up. He's still in the jungles of the Philippines 30 years later. And a, a, he's, he's become famous across the world. And a student, uh, some kind of history student, decided, I'm going to go look for this officer. I mean, he's so hidden, nobody can find him. He's gotten so good, but I'm going to go find him. Well, sure enough, the student ends up finding him. So the student finds 
this officer and tells him, the war's been over for 30 years. And this officer said, nope, this is my station. My, uh, my commander never came back and told me. Well, this student decided that he's going to go find the colonel that, told, that was supposed to come back. He ends up finding him. The man worked at a bookstore or something. And he said, you need to come tell this soldier that the war is over. So this old man comes with him, and they, he goes and finds Officer Haru. And sure enough, this colonel lets him know the war has been over for 30 years. I'm so sorry we forgot about you. All the two other men that were with him had already died. 30 years of Officer Haru having lived a lie, lived in a belief system that kept him fighting a battle that had already been won. I tell you this story because if we don't have a clear understanding of the victory that we have in Christ and what it is that Jesus actually accomplished, the war there are skirmishes still happening in this world, yes? The enemy has been disarmed. The battle has been won. Victory has been declared. Jesus accomplished everything that he set out to do, and he seated, and he seated because he's at rest. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's waiting for his enemies to be made a footstool under his feet. Do you know what that means? The reason why his enemies are not yet a footstool, in the olden days, that meant like um, when when somebody was conquered and um, the enemy, like a king, would bow down before the victorious king and they would put their foot on the neck of the king. That's what that means. The reason why the enemy hasn't yet surrendered is because we have been tasked to take the victory and ensure that the victory gets done here on this earth. That's the authority that we've been given. We've been given authority. We are the ones that Jesus left a task to do. Have you ever given your children a task to do and then you come home and found out that they never did it or they just did a portion of it? Right? Like we have to follow the directions. The directions have been clearly laid out. But if we don't understand the full story, we won't understand what it is that we're supposed to be doing. We are supposed to make the enemy submit to the victory. The victory has been won. It's been done. Jesus has empowered us. He's given everything that we need for life and godliness. Now it's our job to make sure that the enemy surrenders. They haven't surrendered. That's what it is that we face when things come at us. We have to learn how to face it. Now, I'm going to save. It's, it's, I don't have time to finish the rest of this, but you can come to the class um, and you'll get a lot more um, because my goal is to just pound unbelief out of us, okay? That's that's what I'm going to do. Um, Let's stand because it's already late. The important thing to understand and to take away from today is to understand the weapons of your warfare, to understand what it is that God has given us. Some of those weapons are clear. It's joy. It's rejoicing. It's declaring the word. Did you know that we have been made kings and priests unto God? Kings declare things. Kings declare what they want to see happen. The Bible also says that angels respond to the voice of God. And the voice of God is spoken out of our mouths. So when we say things like, by his stripes, I have been healed. You are declaring the word of God and angels respond to that. When you rejoice in the midst of trouble, When somebody has offended you or you're all disgruntled about something, you have a weapon that will make the enemy submit. And that's what I want to leave you with today. Know your weapon. Know what you have been given 
and know that victory has already been declared. You have been empowered with everything that you need. And you have been not just given weapons, you have been given the fruits of all that Christ is. So I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray. I, I've, I was sensing today that the Lord wanted me to pray for anxiety, for depression, and just this overall, I feel like there was this overall feeling of like a disconnect that some people may struggle with. All of that are lies that condemnation has fed us. And the Lord is declaring over you today that he who the Son has set free is free indeed. What Jesus did is he proclaimed, he proclaimed liberty to the captives. That's how we are set free. It's the proclamation that we have been set free. And so I declare over you today, Jesus Christ has set you free. Sin has been disarmed. The power of sin no longer reigns in your body. No longer does the pain that the enemy wants to inflict on us have any power and authority over our lives. Anxiety. Anxiety has been dealt with at the cross. Jesus sweated blood to take on our anxiety. It's done. You're free. I declare you free. Depression must go because depression does not bring life. If that's the work of Satan, he must go out of your life. And I declare peace over minds, peace over bodies. I declare right now that sickness must bow its knee to the name of Jesus. Sin must bow its knee to the name of Jesus. Anxiety must bow its knee to the name of Jesus. A feeling of disconnect, a feeling like God is against you and opposed to you. That is a lie from the pit of hell. And I say, peace in the name of Jesus. Go in the name of Jesus. Life and love, the love of God, be overwhelmed and overtake you. Even as you sleep, you will dream dreams. And God is going to give you visions and pictures of his great love for you. And you are going to walk in authority. and You're going to walk in power. And you will advance the kingdom because you will no longer be afraid. You will know what you have been given. And you will, be, you will know what you have been tasked with. So I release that over every person here today. And I thank you, God, that you are a good father. You are for us and you are not against us. And Jesus, it is finished and we receive everything that you finished. Amen.